So it's streaming live right now. Let's see. Yeah. Cool. We're just trying to figure out the non, uh, well, the technical side of things. Uh, make sure everything is okay. We'll just wait a couple more minutes. Oh, that's okay. I, I figured out how to use it. I don't use Zoom often, so. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's great, Mr. Raj. Okay. Yeah, Isn't it great that we're all, learning, we're all learning technology as we move along, right? This circuit breaker <laughs> has made all of us very tech savvy. I've learned use, so many uh, things. I use Skype often, so I know how to use Skype. Great, yeah. Hi, everyone. Hi. So before we officially start, um, we just want to say so when you my cats are joining. <laughs> Great. Hello, Kitty. Okay, so I'm just going to make sure everyone's muted because uh, it's going to be a really large audience. Yes. Um, make sure the Facebook side is okay as well. Okay. Yeah, we're just checking on the Facebook side of things. Any problems? Okay. Okay, so it's really good to see everyone. Thank you all for joining. Uh, I'm mindful of the time. So without further ado, uh, we are just gonna, you know, kickstart the action. So first and foremost, let me introduce myself. My name is Evelyn. I'm a speech and language therapist. Uh, and I'm also the founder of Aphasia Singapore, Aphasia SG, which is the organizer of this virtual event. Uh, we are so happy to see everyone uh, it's it's such an important topic, right? Um, so a little bit about aphasia. I'm just going to share on my screen right now. So I hope all of you can see the screen. Um, we we wanted to do our motivation for doing a talk like this, right? Is really because we think this is such an important topic, and. We cannot, we cannot stress enough about why we want to do this. Um, the, the community that we have, uh, are, a lot of them are members who have suffered a brain injury or a stroke and questions often come up about it. So let me just uh, share a little bit about what we do at Aphasia Singapore, but first a little bit about the program. So I will first tell you what we do and then I'm going to introduce our esteemed speakers. We have three, we have three panelists with us today. No worries. I know sometimes there's going to be a bit of noise, so don't worry. So the program today is we're going to have our first speaker, Dr. Yong, followed by Ms. Fern and Ms. Wong. I'm going to introduce them a little bit more later on. And after each segment when they share, there will be also a short Q&A. After which, we will have a mass Q&A where you can just post all your questions. We encourage lots of questions. That's the, that's the whole reason we're here, right? So that you can basically tell us, uh, we'll ask the questions that you have on your mind. But first, let me just share a little bit more about what we do at Aphasia um, Singapore. So this is us, our logo. And this month, this is part of our Aphasia Awareness Month. Uh, we want to raise awareness about the condition. And I won't be surprised if many of you have not heard of Aphasia. So just spare me a couple of minutes to tell you more about it. We, we are actually a ground up movement that started in 2018 and um, got formally registered as a non-profit organization last year in May. And we are 100% volunteer led and run. So our mission is really to support people with aphasia, persons with aphasia to lead meaningful lives and to also build an aphasia friendly and inclusive Singapore. So what exactly is aphasia, right? So aphasia happens when the language lobe of the brains, so the highlighted parts, which is typically the left side, suffers an injury. So the injury could be a stroke, a traumatic brain injury, um, you know, a brain tumor infection, and that causes a condition called aphasia. 
And aphasia is a communication impairment. So it's very invisible. If you look at many of our participants, right, because they, they suffered a stroke, but they don't have any physical disabilities, but they suffer from a communication disability, it really impacts their lives in so many ways. Um, and we are here to support them. We want to tell everyone that aphasia can happen to anyone, regardless of age, race, gender, or profession. So we started this pop-up cafe concept called Chit Chat Cafe, which is a safe space where persons with communication impairment can actually join us and you know, come in and feel like it's safe for them to talk. Because when they're out in the larger community, people don't understand aphasia and they find it a struggle to, to even order food or to you know, have, a, have, some of them even lack the confidence to say hello to a stranger. So this is us. From the Chit Chat Cafe, we have also evolved and we started another program, which is the Aphasia Choir, where members who actually have communication impairment when talking can sing. And we are, we are, uh, the, the choir is actually conducted by music therapists, volunteers. Uh, it's pretty amazing. Right now, because of COVID, everything has gone online. We run our programs online. So we have Chit Chat online every second and fourth Saturday. We have our virtual choir. We also do games and craft night. Uh, which are led by occupational therapists, volunteers, and we also do training workshops for caregivers and for, for volunteers. So that's us. Um, and the other part of our mission is to reach out. So like, for example, this event is also part of our outreach where we want to share with people the message of aphasia. We hope that Singapore can be really inclusive and not just look at physical disability, but also communication disability. This is, um, this is me when I had the chance to meet President to share with her about the challenges faced by people with aphasia. And this is another one of our members. So um, with that all said, if you want to learn more about aphasia or if you're keen to volunteer, then please um, you know, find us on, webs on our website, visit the website www.aphasia.sg or you can also scan the QR code and follow us on social media. Thanks for that. Okay, and without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speakers Okay, so um, our first speaker, I'm going to spotlight this for a second. So this is Dr. Yong. Dr. Yong, yeah. <laughs> so Dr. Yong is a consultant neurologist. He has a very, very long profile. So let me flip it. Okay. So he's a consultant neurologist with NNI and also a uh, consultant at Sengkang General Hospital. Um, yeah. So he uh, joined the Department of Neurology in NNI on the, uh, in the SGH campus in 2012 and completed his advanced specialist training in neurology in 2015. So very, very experienced, submitted and published many research papers in medical journal. We are so proud to have him with us today. So honored. Thank you so much, Dr. Yong. Okay, I'm just going to very quickly switch the spotlight to our next two speakers as well so that I can uh, yeah, just spotlight. And this is our second speaker, Ms. Fern. So Fern, yeah, hi. I'm just going to do a round, yeah intro of all the speakers. So Fern is a master trainer for numerous fitness causes um, with uh, the Singapore Sports Council, now known as Sports SG. And she also graduated with a master's in exercise and nutritional science and has vast experiences working in health promotion areas. And she's also the chief wellness officer for a company uh, called FHI, Fitness Health International, that runs a lot of corporate programs. Thank you, Fern, for being with us. And uh, last but not least, we also have Okay, I need to spotlight. Okay, can now can my co-host help me spotlight the third speaker? <laughs> yes, and Hui Sing. Yes. Last but not least, we also have our speaker Hui Sing. Hui Sing is a dietitian and also founder of Healthier You. So she's an accredited dietitian uh, of Singapore with more than nine years of clinical experience working in the field of dietetics, and she's worked in private hospitals, restructured hospitals, and has outstanding diet uh, dietetic knowledge lah, in in specific clinical areas. So weight management, di diabetes, rehab, cancer, kidney. So any questions about diet, she's your person. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to spotlight Dr. Yong. So Kofin, over to you. I'm going to um, flash your slides, all right? Or you want to say something first before I flash the slides? <laughs> You're good? Okay, let me just go right into it. Okay. Oh, okay, hang on. Sorry. Give me a second. Uh. Okay. 
Sorry, technical. Can you all see the slides? Yeah, great. Over to you, Chopin. Okay. Can you see the slides moving? Are you able to see the slides or you can't see the slides? Able to see the slides. Can see? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I tell you what. Uh, let me share the slides from my side. Okay, great. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to stop sharing. Sorry. Yeah. Mm. I think that will be easier. Okay. 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 Can everyone see my slides? Yes. Excellent. I'm just going to do this. Can, can everyone see me flashing? Yes. Okay. All right, Thank everyone. Um, I just want to take, I'm just going to give a, group, a quick thank uh, to everybody in the group for this opportunity to share uh, a bit of my experience and what I know with everyone here. Um, but I also want to take this opportunity to thank Evelyn and the group and congratulate them for the work they've done, for, especially for patients with aphasia. Especially being the only support group in Singapore uh, and, and also myself uh, being involved with other forms of support groups, I can tell you the work involved is, <laughs> is no joke. Uh, the background work that goes into uh, developing and supporting this support group uh, is tremendous. And uh, uh, again, thank you uh, to Evelyn and congratulate you and the team for this. Um, as, as Evelyn has mentioned, yeah. we, will, we will, uh, I will start uh, now. Okay, so, so today uh, I'm just going to talk about uh, the brain, uh, but I will not be able to cover everything about brain diseases as we know there are so many. So I'm just going to focus on two which are quite close um, uh, to what we, always, uh, we, we frequently hear a lot, whether in the magazines or, 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 or newspaper, or even maybe one of our family members uh, or close one's friends has had one of them. Um, so one of them will be stroke and the second one will be dementia. Okay, so I can put this one side, okay. So what is stroke? Um, basically, it's, 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 a, it's a neurological disorder. Whenever the part of the brain is injured or damaged due to mainly arterial occlusion, and where, where it's the cause for majority of the stroke cases, up to 85%, whereas the other one is arterial bleeding. So arterial occlusion, uh, a, a, someone, a person with arterial occlusion may not uh, feel, or rather, how to put it, they, they, during the, when, when there's near occlusion, uh, the patient might not even feel anything until it's totally closed off. Blood flow doesn't reach that part of the brain. The brain is uh, devoid of any oxygen, nutrients uh, carried by the blood, and eventually they die off. And unfortunately, unlike the skin, where you accidentally cut yourself or, or, or even minor burns, you can have new skin. But brain, unfortunately, the tissue is uh, is one where once it's injured, one is dead, it's uh it's, it's dead. Um, but depending on how early we treat, we are able to salvage uh, whatever healthy tissues that is left. So 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 I want to emphasize from my very first slide that uh, if any one of us or if we know anyone who has the following symptoms, which I'm going to describe later later on, uh, please uh, uh, seek medical uh, treatment as soon as possible uh, because you can do something. I'll, I'll, I'll touch on it uh, briefly later. And the other one is arterial bleeding whereby the blood vessel um, due to certain condition, uh, they ruptured. Uh, therefore, therefore uh, blood flow cannot reach the uh, same part of the, uh, the part of the brain, again, leading to uh, uh, stroke. Uh, treatment is different, uh, obviously, from the arterial occlusion causing strokes. Uh, but equally important, so please, and potentially life-threatening, so please come to hospital seek treatment. Um, as I'm not going to mention, talk about, because I'm going to talk more on the stroke due to arterial occlusion, or what we call ischemic stroke, just one, just one thing I want to mention 
uh, 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 regarding the stroke due to arterial bleeding, uh, the most important sign is actually a severe headache. If you had a severe headache, which uh, reaches uh, maximum intensity, like almost immediately or within seconds, you never had had this severe headache before, please come seek treatment. It may be a bleeding due to whatever cause. Okay. Now, I always believe prevention is better than cure. And therefore, these are, and I've already listed, or rather I extracted uh, this very nice table from uh, uh, article not too long ago in 2017. I suppose we can't do anything about this column. Uh, um, the older we are, certain gender, especially male, uh, certain race or ethnicity. Um, however, we can do something about this column, which uh, I'm so glad that uh, I have Fern and who is in here to help me out later on, uh, where, where diet and physical inactivity will be. Uh, uh, I'm sure uh, Fern and Huizin will help me more on that. Otherwise, if you have hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, um, apart from diet, exercise, please take your medication uh, uh, consistently. And if there's any reason that you, you can't take the medication, uh, please let uh, your doctor know. Uh, we, we certainly can figure out some other form or, or some other formulation of medication. Um, stop smoking. Um, and then nowadays we don't look, we don't really look at BMI anymore, especially uh, our Asian population. We look at the race to hip ratio, which uh, I'm going to touch a bit later as well. So as you can see, even for hemorrhagic strokes, the strokes due to arterial bleeding, the risk factors are roughly the same. So we try to settle or try to control this. Okay. Now, how to recognize stroke? If let's say we have tried our best, we can't prevent, and uh, we have stroke, and how do we know now? So one way uh, is this uh, mnemonic fast, uh, which also uh, represent uh, or, or highlight the importance of how, how early or how immediate we need to seek treatment. Now, if F is of face, so if uh, any one of us or our loved ones, friends, Notice that there's a droop on one side of the face, be it left side or right side. If the face looks uneven, do seek treatment, it can be a cause of stroke. If there's any arm weakness, numbness, numbness, and if it involves not only one side, but both sides, also there's a possibility it's a stroke, please come to see us as early as possible. Most of the strokes are usually one-sided. If it's both sides, uh, usually, uh, usually means the stroke uh, is, is of a... Uh, is of, uh, um, uh, wider extent, uh, so 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 do come seek treatment. Speech, uh, which is important, not just not just because uh, today we are uh, 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 nicely hosted by Mr. Dr. Org, but it, uh, it is true that if you have any difficulty speaking or if the speech sounds strange, please do seek treatment. S sounds strange means like slurring of speech where. Uh, certain words don't sound um, like what they should. Uh, difficult speaking can also mean that like aphasia where um, the words are in your mind but you can't say it out, you have difficulty saying it out or even writing it out or, um, or other type of aphasia which uh, we will not uh, touch uh, for the purpose of today. Now finally T is for time. In Singapore please call 995 and come to A&E or, uh, or, or, or walk to the uh, A&E yourself if the weakness is not a, a, a big problem. Now the heart doctor, we always say time is heart, for us is time is brain. Now this is fast, uh, but do in, uh, this, this, this FAS, do in mind they are the commonest symptoms that we, uh, that we see in uh, patients with stroke. However, there are other symptoms of stroke that one need to be aware of. If they suddenly, um, if you develop like a curtain coming down your eye, curtain of darkness coming out of, out of eye, resulting in total blindness for even a few seconds or minutes, it's, it's considered uh, what we call a minor stroke or TIA, transient ischemic attack. So it also warrants treatment, it warrants further evaluation for the cause of the stroke because different cause of stroke has their own uh, uh, specific management. So do come, so do go to the ENA as soon as possible. 
Uh, if you have suddenly, if you have sudden uh, giddiness, which is very severe, a lot of nausea, vomiting, slurring of speech, uh, also can be a sign of stroke. And finally, if you start walking like someone who has been taking alcohol the whole night, it's possible that it's also a stroke. So do come uh, seek medical consultation. If uh, hopefully not, but if you end up, or your family members, or or you know anyone who. Uh, has stroke and treated in at least in uh, eh, sorry in uh, SGH or Tandok Singh because we are because neurologists in SGH and Tandok Singh are from NNI. Uh, we have this uh, brochure that we give out. Okay. Now, so first we try to recognize what are the symptoms and signs of stroke, and we try to control the risk factors. If we can't, we uh, uh, we, will, we, we will have to seek treatment. So how do we seek treatment? Now again, for the stroke causing, uh, due to arterial blockage, what they call ischemic stroke, which is a vast majority of all strokes, there are two types of uh, uh, treatment that we can give. One is uh, what, uh, medication, and the other one is some procedure that we can, like ballooning for the heart, but we can do the ballooning for the brain to help open up the, the blood vessel. However, this is time dependent, and therefore uh, uh, there's a window period that, we, that, that only we can do this procedure, after which, uh, it, after which there will be other complications like bleeding and, and, and so forth. And therefore, it's not recommended to be done if you pass that certain window period. Um, once treated with stroke, uh, diagnosed and given acute treatment stroke, we will also give uh, uh, certain treatment to prevent to hopefully uh, pre uh, prevent a second, third, fourth stroke in the future. Uh, bleeding strokes, I'm not going to touch too much, but uh, basically we try to salvage whatever brain damage possible. We try to reduce as much bleeding as possible. Now, the, not, in addition to all medication and, and, and all this uh, pharmacological treatment, what we, what we call, we also uh, involve speech therapies, especially if there's speech difficulty, we involve physiotherapies and occult therapies, especially if there's weakness, uh, gait disturbances, we get dietitian involved to help out uh, patients to, to come up with what is considered as low salt intake and, and so forth. Uh, pharmacies is important as uh, not only uh, to, to tell us what are the, the, the latest uh, uh, evidence in terms of side effects and whatnot, but also in terms of smoking uh, cessation. Those who want to stop smoking but find it difficult, we have patches, we have um, uh, nicotine gum which, uh, for chewing, which pharmacies can help us with. So once again, what, what, what after the acute treatment, what we can do, so about our medication, again, trying to prevent the next attack by controlling all these factors. Now I'm just going to uh, briefly touch on dementia, which is my second part of the topic. Now, according to WHO 2019, while it's written there as WHO 2019, actually the definition is, uh, is a very old definition. Uh, nothing, has, nothing has changed significantly. Basically, dementia is a group of disorders characterized by a reduction in their previously attained cognitive level that also affects activity or daily living. This activity or daily living can be either basic ADLs, such as bathing, uh, uh, toileting, dressing, feeding yourself, as well as instrumental ADLs, such as uh, handling your own finances, uh, getting your own groceries, uh, and so forth. Now, how to recognize dementia? If you look at this uh, slide, it's very busy. There are many symptoms that, that can represent dementia, but one thing that is particularly uh, prominent is uh, memory recall, especially short term. Um, like what did I just, what 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 did, what did I just uh, tell you? The last slide, uh, as as quick as that. Uh, however, what I uh, did for my last birthday, I probably can remember better. So these are the this forgetfulness or memory recall difficulty is one of the most prominent uh, symptoms. Now, one thing I want to take opportunity here to 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 say, uh, uh, because I forgot to mention in my stroke slides, is that. Stroke symptoms happen just like that. It's immediate because there's arterial blockage, no blood flow to the brain. 
you, you, the symptoms are acute. Whereas dementia, all these symptoms, they take time to occur over time. They, they, they take time to, for the symptoms to develop uh, because this is a, a, what we call neurodegenerative disease. It's almost like, uh, like a wear and tear of the brain. So if you have any of these symptoms, or uh, I should, sorry, what I meant was if you know any one of these symptoms, uh, please be aware. Um, um, uh, advice to, to seek medical consultation. Now, I just want to briefly mention uh, the causes of dementia because if you look at the second column, which is this, if you have any of these medical conditions leading to secondary dementia, if you detect them earlier, or rather if you detect them, you give them the appropriate treatment, they, the, they might not uh, develop dementia per se. However, the commonest cause is unfortunately is still Alzheimer's disease, whether is it primary or secondary. All forms of dementia, Alzheimer is still the commonest. And unfortunately, until today, there is still no cure. The research is always still ongoing. But in my next few slides, we can see a few things that we can try to reduce the risk of getting this. Um, again, the modifier risk factors or risk factors that we can try to do something with in order to reduce the risk. If you remember my slight strokes, they are almost the same, except social isolation and cognitive inactivity is important risk factors that you can try that we can try to control. Meaning that uh, I, I, uh, I usually ask my patients to continue uh, going out with friends, um, uh, maybe even playing mahjong uh, without the gambling part. And, uh, and uh, so forth. Now, these are the latest risk reduction measures recommended by WHO 2019. Uh, you can find it online, but I've summarized here for you. Number one, exercise regularly. Example, 30 minutes each time for most days of the week. Uh, this will equate to maybe like four days of, or uh, if not more in a week. Stop smoking. Uh, have a healthy balanced diet, uh, including a lot of vegetables, fruits, which uh, Huisin will uh, hopefully share more with us later. Uh, for those who drink, uh, try your best to stop. If not, reduce the intake. Do not binge drink. For those who don't drink, <laughs> try to continue staying away from alcohol. Now, uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, stay intellectually and socially active. Be join a mix, join mix around with your friends, uh, uh, involve in, in, in activities such as which, which uh, challenges the mind, uh, even chess, if not mahjong. Uh, but of course, uh, I can really can hear someone uh, uh, properly whispering that, oh, it's COVID-19. So even if you can't do this now, you can do the rest. Um, I'm not going to go through this. It's just a supplementary slide. So take home message. Um, this is my last slide. Seek medical consultation early, especially if you have any of those uh, symptoms that I mentioned, especially if it's uh, very acute in nature uh, because you're suspecting a stroke. It, it may be a bleeding, especially when you have severe headache or is a ischemic stroke, which is the commonest cause for, uh, of all strokes. And if it's ischemic stroke, we can do something for you within the window period. While we cannot promise we can uh, uh, cure 100%, but at least we can try to salvage as much brain damage as possible. And finally, prevention is uh, always better than cure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bin. No problem. I, yeah, I think um, that was really insightful, especially, I mean, there, there are definitely a lot of questions from our members asking about stroke prevention as well as um, dementia. These are definitely some of the more common questions. So thanks for addressing it. So there's no some problem. other questions that came up. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, there was this question about um, sleep. So uh, there's hmm. been a lot of, yeah. So one of the members of the audience actually asked, there's been a lot of um, talk about how sleep is very important to brain health. Can you share with us or shed some insight on that? Ah, so yes, as although I didn't mention, but sleep is, if you don't sleep well, uh, they have, okay. Um, 
conditions that leading to uh, inability to sleep well, such as or something called sleep apnea, has been associated with uh, high blood pressure. And as you know, high blood pressure is a risk factor for uh, many neurological disorders. And as I mentioned, one of the big ones is stroke. So um, if someone has a lot of uh, heavy snoring at night, unable to, to pay attention the next morning, and even if you if the if the person feels like the, the he or she has been sleeping the whole night, um, but still having a lot of uh, daytime sleepiness, uh, that's that's a sign that uh, you may have sleep apnea. You may need to see a see doctor to uh, have it diagnosed or excluded, and if you diagnose, to seek treatment because it has uh, downstream implications. Now, if there's no other disorder, just unable to sleep also can uh, result in. Uh, 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 many issues, many symptoms. Sometimes it may not be due to stroke or, or, or any other um, uh, established neurological disorders, but you can have a lot of non-specific symptoms such as a bit of numbness here, weakness there, uh, headaches uh, uh, such as migraine, tension headaches. Those, those headaches are, are, are well-known uh, or, or rather uh, poor sleep has been uh, is well-known to be a risk uh, factor for more attacks of migraines and headaches. So yes, sleeping is very important, not just for neurological disorders, but also for the general health being. Thanks for that. Okay, I better watch my sleep habits. I'm not, I don't think I sleep particularly well, but um, yes. <laughs> okay, uh, we are happy to take any questions. Okay, so there is a question from Jane. How to get temperamental dementia elderly to engage in social activities. I'm just going to expand that question a little bit because there is another question about how do we prevent dementia from progressing? So you talked about prevention, but how do right. you prevent dementia from progressing further? So I think that's a little bit linked to Jane's question. Now. So if you could ah. touch a little bit on that, yeah. Thanks, Yvonne, for the question and whoever that posed that question now. Yeah. Actually, maybe I didn't phrase uh, my slide properly. What I meant from this slide, these are not only risks, uh, these are not only measures to reduce the risk of getting dementia, but actually they are also measures to, pre, uh, to, to help delay progression of dementia. Mm. Now, these are non-pharmacological methods. We do have some medication that we can try to slow down progression, but the, the benefit, I must admit, is not that strong. Um, we can, it's, it's more like we can try uh, uh, something uh, better than nothing. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think it does. I mean, um, yeah, there's, yeah, because there's also questions. There's quite a stream of questions coming in right now. So keep the questions coming. We will have a mass Q&A Q at the end because some of these questions may be taken by the other professionals. Um, yeah, so like there's this question about um, yeah, the role of exercise, which I think, you know, Fern can also touch a little bit on. And also the, the soft side of things, you know, how social connections and social well-being actually helps the brain. Ah, so, um, <laughs> so, we do not, so, so, so basically it's like this, if we, at least for stroke, and, and, and especially dementia, um, there's many studies in looking at uh, being alone uh, uh, with depression and uh, the, the risk of getting dementia. Now, I can't, I can't remember off it, uh, of, uh, of it that there's a, there's a certain number or, or paper, but certainly the, uh, uh, there's, there's, there's strong evidence to suggest that um, if you if you stay isolated alone, uh, and let's say in, in scenarios where where you're stressed, you're unable to share your stress with uh, your stress burden with anyone else. You have no one to ventilate or talk uh, things out, or, or or have someone to be there um, to just uh, take away some of your your distress. Um, uh, your risk of getting dementia may be higher. But of course, by itself, is is not a strong risk factor. But but collectively, um, uh, is something that we can try to to, to uh, how to put it. Uh, 
try to improve or, or try to do to reduce our overall risk of getting dementia. Right. Okay. And and I just want to I just want to share that a lot of my advices for dementia and stroke, uh, as you can see, there are not many things which are very specific, whether it is for stroke or dementia. Again, it's, it's more for general well-being. I'm, I'm very sure that the cardiolo cardiologist would say the same thing. Uh, respiratory uh, uh, specialists would say the same thing. Yeah. We share the same thing. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Pin. We will come back to hey, you no right problem. at the end when we do the mass Q&A. Now yep. I'm going to introduce our next panelist. We have Fern. So I'm going to spotlight Fern. Yes. Thank you so much. Yes. Oh, wait, are you spotlighted? Wait, uh, hang on. Can we spotlight Fern again? Yeah. So, um, yes, Fern, Fern knows what she's talking about. She's going to be talking about the fitness and exercise side of things. Oh, wait, I think she, Fern is not spotlighted. Can we, can we spotlight Fern? Yes. So, Fern, over to you. I share my own slide? Yes, uh, I think that's better. Yes. Okay, sure. You can hear me, right? Yes, we can. Okay, great. All right, so today we're going to talk about exercise and the brain. Yeah, I think in general, uh, Singapore population are quite well educated about the benefit of exercise in terms of the physical benefits of it. Um, but less known is the part about the brain uh, benefits. So with, that's what I'm going to share a little bit more about. So, um, well, so exercise, how does it improve our brain function, etc. Now, some of us might think that, okay, you know, sometimes if you have friends uh, who say that, okay, they are a bit moody, they are a bit down, uh, and they went shopping and they feel better. Of course, um, there are people like that. So then we wonder, you know, what, what actually happened? Why is it that when people go shopping, they actually feel better, right? So usually what happened is uh, there's... Uh, there's chemicals that's released in our brain uh, to make us feel better after shopping. And that actually can be improved by uh, not spending money, in a sense, right? Uh, because when we exercise, the same chemical that is released in our brain when you go shopping um, will actually be released if you, uh, when you're exercising. So in a way, um, exercise helps to improve the mood because dopamine, a uh, chemical in your brain, will be released whenever you start to do exercise. So that is kind of a good uh, money-saving method to make, you start, make yourself feel good. All right. The second one which we talked about just now is about sleep. So when we exercise, another chemical, it would be interesting to know that there's many chemicals that's released in our brain when we exercise. Serotonin is actually released in our brain to make us sleep better. All right, so uh, you can try if you have got uh, insomnia sometimes uh, by doing some exercise, um, the chemicals in the brain will help you sleep better. And also maybe physically you're more tired, uh, you will sleep better as well. All right. Um, the other thing is also um, the same chemical that's released will help you uh, improve your appetite as well. So uh, not just the chemical reaction in your brain that makes you improve your appetite, maybe because when you're exercising, your calorie expenditure uh, is actually more, so you will probably need to eat more, your appetite will become better as well. All right, so the third thing, which, um, well, some of us, uh, in our, especially in, uh, during our days, uh, when we, if you're in the 40s or 50s, you'll see that a lot of parents at our time, when we were in school, uh, they do not like their children to uh, take part in a lot of sports and physical activity because they rather that the children all spend time uh, revising their homework, uh, etc. Okay. Um, the, the problem is sometimes by just doing a lot of study in a long duration of time, it might not actually help with the retention of the knowledge or in terms of uh, helping to increase the focus and the attention when your children are studying. So one other thing that you might want to think about is actually exercise helps to increase the focus and the attention of an individual and that can actually last for a good two hours immediately after exercise. So you might want to think about how uh, you have observed that some of the sportsmen, all right, the national athletes, they are actually very uh, good students in a sense with very good results. Okay, so that, that is one of the uh, evidence to show that actually some, some um, or rather the attention span of 
a student, for example, if you're studying, uh, or the, uh, the focus of the student actually improves after uh, exercising. So this is also something that you might want to really consider, especially for parents uh, who are having uh, school going children. All right, so uh, encourage them to do some sports, um, come back to study, take a break, have a jog or walk, and then come back to study again. All right, so there's another benefit that we have. A third one is um, depression and anxiety. All right, so a lot of um, people suffering from depression or anxiety, uh, there are studies to show that um, they are depression and anxiety is actually um, um, relief or rather the symptoms are actually reduced by doing some exercise. Reason is when we exercise, another chemical called endorphin is actually released in our brain uh, and that helps the people to feel better. All right. So uh, in fact, uh, if, uh, if your friend's doing a lot of long distance run, uh, there are people who are kind of addicted to running because they have the runner's high in the sense that when you run, you feel good. And that is one of the reasons because endorphin is being released in the brain. Well, what happened is uh, another reason for um, depression and anxiety to be uh, reduced when you exercise is also because whenever uh, people who suffer from depression and anxiety, they typically have a very uh, vicious cycle of negative thoughts in their mind. So when you are exercising, so for example, if you take a run out, you see the greeneries in the park, you see people, other people doing exercise, or if you're engaged in a team sport, you'll be very focused on the sports and you take your mind off from the negative thoughts um, that could be affecting you in your depression and anxiety. So this is also another um, good uh, benefits from exercise. Um, and also, uh, well, just let me talk about a similar disease and uh, related dementia. Exercise, well, has not been proven to prevent it, but it has been proven to delay the onset of um, a similar diseases and related dementia. So that is definitely a very good um, benefit or outcome from doing a long-term exercise. Um, the other thing, other than uh, just now we, we spoke about uh, the fact that if you have um, if if you have a better motor skill uh, through you through exercise, um, the other thing is also when you do uh, exercise, your reaction time will be reduced. Okay, so that could also be one of the benefits that comes out from um, regular exercise. So um, another the good benefits of exercise is that the memory increase. All right, because what happened is um, your certain part of your brain cells actually regenerates and uh, becomes uh, bigger, have bigger capacity when you exercise and your memory can then be uh, improved in that sense. All right, and the rest of the few benefits are more physical benefits that are uh, not really related to the brain, but we uh, uh, touch on just now, Dr. Yong touched on that um, during the last uh, segment, where we talk about uh, cardiovascular diseases like uh, high cholesterol, hypertension, diabetes. Um, studies have shown that exercise can effectively help to reduce these issues, this, uh, to reduce the health risk of uh, hypertension, high cholesterol and uh, diabetes. So this has been proven as well. The other one uh, is more physical too. Um, if you exercise, um, you will have stronger muscles to help support your bones and therefore help to also reduce the burden, if, especially if you are heavier on a bigger side, um, help to reduce the burden on muscular skeletal structure. All right, so that actually helps a lot to reduce pain and aches. And just now, we, uh, Dr. Yong spoke about the activities of daily living. Um, exercise can help to increase uh, strength and flexibility of a person and therefore help to reduce, um, improve the ability to engage in the daily live, activities of daily living. For example, if, you are, uh, if there's a need for you to climb up the overhead bridge, all right. So if you have the cardiovascular fitness, if you have the strength in your lower limbs, it is easier for you to climb up the staircase of the overhead bridge without panting 
difficult, uh, very, di very difficultly. Or if you uh, reach an age where you have grandchildren, all right, if you don't have the muscle strength to carry your grandchildren, right, so that will also not be very um, uh, happy situation for yourself. Um, or even the simplest things like, you know, if you were to sit on the toilet bowl and you need to get up, you'll be surprised that in uh, a lot of people in their age of uh, 80s or 90s, um, they, when they lose the muscle strength in their legs, they are not even able to get up from the toilet bowl on their own. Okay, and this is due to a loss in the muscle strength. So uh, by doing exercise, uh, it actually helps with the activities of daily living as well. So as you can see here, exercise not just helps with the physical aspect of health, but also uh, the mental aspect in terms of the brain health. All right, so you might ask here, so what are the things that we can do for exercise? All right, as specific to the brain, okay, just now we talk about uh, activities of daily living or improving the uh, strength for the muscular, to reduce the burden on the muscular skeletal structure. Those are more on a strength improvement. But today we are going to focus a little bit more on the cardiovascular fitness improvement because um, the brain health improvement, um, studies have shown that these are, uh, actually attributed to cardiovascular fitness exercises. So we're going to focus a little bit more to talk about cardiovascular fitness exercises today. So how do we start to do that? All right, so just now Dr. Yong talked about minimum 30 minutes per session. So meaning that let's say if you were to go swimming, all right, uh, when we used to have a lot of people swimming in the pool before the circuit breaker, all right, so we see that um, people sometimes swim for a lap and then they rest, all right. Uh, they might start chatting with their friends in one side of the pool for another 10 minutes before they swim again. Okay, so that is not a continuous 30 minutes of cardiovascular fitness activity. All right, so the type of exercises that we're talking about, cardiovascular fitness exercises, can involve things that gets you to um, breathe a little bit harder. So for example, when you are jogging, when you're cycling, when you're swimming, um, continuously 30 minutes, that will be very helpful to your cardiovascular fitness, three to four times a week. So for example, if you uh, take a stroll after your dinner for once a week, you play Tai Chi for another week, if you do yoga for another week, all right, so in this case, although you have been so-called exercising three times a week, it is not three times a week of cardiovascular exercises. So that is what we are talking about. It needs to be three to four times a week of cardiovascular exercises. All right, and how hard should we be exercising? So for example, if you are going for a stroll after dinner, all right, so it can, in fact, when you are strolling, you can even sing a song, all right? So in that case, you are not exercising hard enough. So what we need to ensure that you are exercising at a certain intensity for the benefits of exercise to be felt. So how does it go? So you have to um, exercise at Minimum, okay, if you have not been exercising for the last 20 years, for example, minimum about 55% of your maximum heart rate. So what is your maximum heart rate? A very simple way to calculate that is to take 220 minus your age. So if I'm 40 this year, okay, it will be 180 is my maximum. So when I'm taking my heart rate, okay, so a lot of us have Fitbit, you have the tracking device from health promotion board. So that will give you the heart rate when you are exercising. Now, if you do not have that device, one easy way is to take your heart rate from the neck here. So you can see from here, All right? You can feel for your pulse or you can feel for your pulse here. Okay, from somewhere around here, you can take your pulse. Uh, you, how to show from <laughs> the screen? Okay, here, yes. All right, somewhere around here. All right, so basically you need to take your pulse for a minute, all right, if it is 180, that is 100% of your heart rate. You should not be exercising at 100%. Okay, so you should be exercising at 55 to 80. All right, so if you have not been very exercising very regularly, start from 55. After two weeks or so, increase another 10% or 5%. All right, so this is how you can calculate. So for example, if I am just started to do exercise after 20 years, I just want to go 55% of 180 if I'm 40 years old. Okay, so this is a very easy way, but all of us know that we have come across people who are very old, but they are super fit. And we have come across people who are very young, but they're not fit at all. So in this case, we have a more accurate way of calculating the target intensity that the person should be exercising as to follow a carbonin formula. So those of you who feel that it's a bit complicated to write it down today, you can actually go Google search for carbonin formula. 
it looks something like that. So what you need to do is to take into consideration of something that is called the resting heart rate. Okay, so how we go is that everyone, when you uh, say wake up in the morning, you can take your heart rate tomorrow when you wake up in the morning. That will be your resting heart rate. So before you start to do anything, when you're at rest, that will be your resting heart rate. So most of us will have our resting heart rate between 60 to 80. Now, if your resting heart rate is, say, 65, for example, okay, and if your age is 50, all right, so this is uh, step one is to calculate 220 minus your age. That will be 170 for your maximum heart rate. However, that is not the it yet, so we need to do step two. Step two is to take 170 minus your resting heart rate, the one that you will be taking tomorrow, and that will be another one where you need to calculate a step three. So how do we do step three? So basically the idea is that once you have derived a figure for step two, all right, you will take a percentage. So now here the example shows that it's 75% because maybe this person has been exercising for some time, we're going for 75%. But remember, if you have not been exercising for the longest time, all right, take 55 or 60 for a start and then increase the five to 10% after two weeks. So imagine, uh, for example, this person we are using 75%, then we will take 105, multiply by 75% and you add back your resting heart rate, which means that in this case, if you derive at 144, when you are exercising, your heart rate should be beating at 144 beats per minute. So if you are strolling and it shows on your device or when you take your heart rate manually, it shows 120, it means that you should be walking a little bit faster. Okay, alternatively, if let's say you're jogging and your heart rate shows is, uh, your device shows that it's 154, it means that you can slow down a little bit. All right, so 144, if that is what you have derived, is what you are looking at to achieve during your 30 minutes of exercise for three to four times a week. All right, so this is how we can do. Now, it might sound a little bit technical. However, it's important for you to know that uh, your interest is uh, to do consider your interest, the personality and the constraint when you are thinking of what exercises to do. So for example, some people feel that um, they, they are the very sociable people. They do not like like boring things like jogging. Okay, so then um, you can actually engage after maybe this uh, CV is over. You can actually do uh, soccer, all right, basketball, things that engage uh, more people to play together. All right, or your personality is such that you're very goal driven. All right, then you can get yourself to uh, fix a goal of I'm going to complete two kilometers this week. Next week, I'm going to do like two and a half kilometers. So the idea is that depending on your personality, you might want to fix your program, your exercise plan according to your personality instead. Okay, so whether you're somebody who is goal driven or you're not. All right, and then constraint. All right, if, if it is raining, yeah, so it doesn't mean that if I, I have to run, I have to run, even if it rains, you know, what's going to happen? So maybe you can consider climbing the staircase because all of us stay in HDB flat, all right? So there are certain things that we can, we need to be aware of uh, due to the weather, etc. that we need to uh, plan for a, a contingency plan in the event that we cannot do the type of exercises that we want to do. So this is one way to ensure that um, our exercise can be sustainable. All right. And importantly is to enjoy what you're doing. Okay. If you feel you're dragging yourself out of the bed to go for a jog in the morning, then that is not the type of exercise that you are looking at. All right. And we should actually treat exercise as a lifestyle, um, meaning that uh, you should not be exercising today and Next, more, next month, you feel that you do not want to exercise anymore. It should be something that we do it consistently over a lifetime rather than um, just because after the session today, you feel that you should be exercising, then we exercise for a week. Okay, so that, that should not be the way. Um, remember, whatever benefits that we spoke about that you will get from doing the exercises, you will lose them once you stop it. Okay, so this is something that is very cruel, right? You will get the benefits if you start doing it, but you will lose it if you stop doing it as well. Okay, so it is something that has to be sustainable over the lifetime and we shouldn't be doing it just for once. All right, so having said that, we're going to do some exercises together. So if you have got some uh, space around you, we're going to do some chair exercise. So don't need to get up, you're still seated on the chair. So I'm just going to stop the slides and put on some music. Uh, due to the... Uh, 
the online constraints. So we are going to just when I, when we are doing the exercise later, I'm not going to say anything. Just follow my action and enjoy the exercise. All right. So we're going to share the music in a while. I will stop sharing your screen, okay, so that you can focus on the the view. I will uh, stop okay, sharing your screen. Okay, but I need to share oh. screen as well oh, for the music. You need right? to share screen. Okay, okay. Yeah, for the music, uh, just for the music. Okay, okay, great. Go mm. ahead. Yeah. Okay, great. Hope everyone is ready for some chair exercises. <laughs> I can see Mr. Adisa is really yeah. warming up. Uh, really warming up. Oh, that's exactly. nice. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Can you hear? <laughs> yep, yeah, everyone can hear? Yes, yes. They call me Cuban Pete. I'm the king of the rumba beat. When I play the maracas, I go chick chick boom chick chick boom. When I start to that dance, the thing goes tick tick boom tick tick boom. Those senoritas they are singing and they're swinging and the rumbero. It's a very nice, double up style. And when they dance and they are ringing, I be swing the merengue, singing that song all the day long. They call me Cuban beat, I'm the king of the rumba beat. When I play the merengue, I go tick tick boom tick tick boom. We have a uh, question from the audience. So there is a question that asks, so is it enough to just do 30 minutes of chair exercises like this every day? So don't need to stand up and walk, just sit down and do this every day. Is that enough? Can they do it three times a week? Just sit down and do this 30 minutes. <laughs> right, so it depends on where you are starting from. If let's say you have not been exercising for a very long time, this is good enough to raise your heart rate. Right, so just now remember we were talking about your target intensity. So if let's say you haven't been exercising very regularly, you are so-called a little bit unfit, all right, this is good enough. But if you have been exercising very regularly, so imagine the, 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 the triatolics, they are not going to pan at all when you are doing this. All right, then that is not good enough. 
All right, so you have to um, note that as well. And also because if you are doing it on a chair, um, you are not putting the, uh, the weight on your body, your lower limbs. All right, so it's not very helpful to uh, things like prevent osteoporosis for your lower limbs and all that. So you might want to consider that as well. Ah, okay. Thank you so much. Thanks for answering the question. Yes, thanks, Fern. Okay, we will come back to you at the end. There's also a request for the slide. Uh, because somebody in the audience wants to actually have the formula, but we will get that at the end, okay? So I'm mindful of the time. We're going to very quickly move on to our last panelist, uh, Hui Sing. So uh, can we have Hui Sing? Yes, yeah. Hi, Hui Sing. Yeah, Hui Sing is our, is, is our dietitian, very experienced and knows, um, has worked with many, many, uh, in many clinical areas. Uh, and she's also the founder of a company, uh, an, an organization called Healthier You. So she will be sharing with us about um, nourishing our brain with good nutrition. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Oh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Hi, everyone. Yep. Thank you, Evelyn and the team of Asia SG for inviting me to share a little bit of knowledge, actually, uh, yeah, mainly on nutrition related to brain health. Okay, so before I actually move on, um, maybe uh, in the chat group, you could uh, type in, uh, there's this question, um, when do you think that we need to nurture our brain cells with good nutrition? Is it during infancy, during childhood, during adulthood, or throughout our lives? So what is your opinion? You can actually type it in the chat group so that I can see it. Seems like most people are typing All right. D. Yes. Oh, sure. So I'll proceed. And then before actually moving on to review the answer, Okay, as you can see in the slides, um, uh, uh, actually the brain develops very rapidly when um, a, a fetus is formed actually in the mother's womb. So that's why all the pregnant ladies are given these DHA supplements, fish oil supplements to help with the brain development of the baby. And um, when the baby is born, actually the brain continues to develop and 90% actually of a child's brain development um, yeah, occur actually before age of five. What about yeah, when we grow older? What happened to our brain? So as you can see, actually, um, our brain tends to shrink after, um, or started to shrink actually, after actually um, when we reach 40 years old and above. Yeah. And the rate of actually a decline or shrinking of the brain actually, uh, it's more rapid actually after uh, age of 70. That's why uh, we see actually a lot of elderly, um, 70 or 80 above actually, they tends to develop dementia. All right, so research actually has shown that um, by um, eating a lot of vegetables, fruits, nuts, and seeds, as well as actually feeds, it can actually help with our brain health. All right, so yes, all of you are right. So we need to actually nurture our brain cells with good nutrition throughout our lives all the time. Yep. So what is actually a brain healthy diet? Okay, another question. What are the nutrients good for your brain? Is it omega-3? Is it antioxidants or is it vitamin Bs or all of the above? You can actually share your um, answers in the chat group as well. All right, I can see a lot of D, 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 D. Okay, cool. Seems like um, I think uh, many of you actually have some knowledge in terms of uh, the brain health. So I will be actually going deeply into it. All right, so a brain healthy diet actually it's equivalent to a healthy balanced diet. So what you can see, um, our health promotion board always actually encourages us to follow a My Healthy Plate. So what does it mean? Um, they encourage us to eat more fruits and vegetables. So fill half of your plate with fruits and vegetables, uh, a quarter of it with the whole grains and the remaining quarter with the uh, protein foods like fish, meat, and tofu. And they also encourage us to use healthier oils, uh, choose water over sweetened drinks, and be active. All right, so... I'll, I would go through actually uh, five rules actually to help us to maintain a good brain uh, functions. So number one will be um, actually having or uh, focusing actually on healthy fats, especially omega-3. So as can, you can see actually in the pictures, um, you can see avocado, um, maybe some nuts like walnuts, seeds, pumpkin seeds, um, even almonds, um, salmon fish, all this actually gives us healthy fats. But I would want to actually focus on omega-3, well, one of the healthy fats, because uh, this actually uh, is very important in our brain health. And um, the total actually shows like 
uh, different type of fish, especially fatty fish like salmon, sardine, tuna, codfish, and mackerel, gives us actually a higher amount of omega-3. And of course, uh, from the plant-based uh, sources like chia seeds, flax seeds, or uh, even some uh, omega-3 enriched eggs, and um, oils like canola oil, cod liver oil, and flaxseed oil, um, they give us actually another type of omega-3 um, fatty acids, which is called ALA, and our body actually needs to convert it into this um, DHA or the EPA that is actually good for the brain. But uh, however, the conversion actually in the body is uh, limited and it's also actually um, affected by actually the other nutrients um, that's in our body as well. So um, sometimes people will ask if I don't take fish at all or if I am a vegetarian, how do I get this actually omega-3? So um, uh, you have to actually take a lot of those um, plant-based sources actually with ALA and then um, so that because the conversion is um, probably a 10% or lesser actually into this EPA or DHA that needed by our brain to regenerate. Yeah, so a healthy actually adult needs almost about 0 0.25 to uh, 0 0.5 gram of the EPA or DHA fatty acid per day. Are you getting enough? Um, usually we will actually recommend uh, fatty fish like the salmon, tuna and all this, um, two servings in a week and one serving is like probably about 100 gram if you can see uh, like my palm size and then um, that should be good enough to actually uh, help you to get uh, the adequate amount of the EPA and DHA in a day. All right, so the rule number two will be increase your fruit and vegetables. And as you know, fruits and vegetables provide us with the vitamin C, vitamin E, and also some of the phytonutrients that act as an antioxidant. So we need to eat a variety of fruits and vegetables from different colors for their different phytonutrients. For example, the white color food like cauliflower gives us anthocyanins. The purple or blue actually color foods like maybe uh, purple cabbage or blueberries actually gives us the anthocyanins. Um, uh, orange or yellow color foods uh, gives us the car carotenoids. Whereas the red color foods like tomatoes, capsicums, give us a lycopene. And the green color, uh, leafy vegetables, usually gives us a lutein. All these are the antioxidants that uh, help our body actually um, to fight against the inflammation. All right, group number three will be actually increase your fiber intake by switching to whole grains. So what does it mean by whole grains? Maybe you will think of like brown rice or wholemeal bread, but there are also other whole grains, including barley, um, but with even corn, um, yep, so oatmeal, um, millet. So these are actually also other whole grains that you can actually uh, add in into your diet. Uh, because um, a lot of time whole grains are um, enriched actually or uh, rich sources of vitamin Bs and these vitamin Bs are good for brain health. And uh, uh, rule number four will be reduce red meat and um, high fat dairy products. Um, so they actually... Uh, there are research actually shows that um, by following a Mediterranean diet, which they uh, seldom take red meat, it actually helps with the brain health and helps to actually uh, reduce the risk of dementia. So that's the reason why uh, I put it in over here as well. And whereas actually, um, yeah, just now the rule number one, we talk about um, up for healthier fats and a lot of time the dairy products like our probably butter, our um, full cream or uh, yogurt or even cheese, um, so these are actually uh, the sources of saturated fats, which is the unhealthy fats in our diet. Yeah. So um, by having actually a um, high amount of these saturated fats or the unhealthy fats, it tends to increase our risk of getting stroke and cardiovascular disease as well. All right. So, and the last um, or the fifth rule actually is to say no to sugary drinks. And of course, um, plain water will be the best. If not, then you can choose actually uh, some no sugar added drinks like plain tea, plain coffee, or even um, lower sugar version of uh, some of these. And when a lot of us likes desserts, and I do <laughs> as well. So how to actually uh, reduce the uh, refined sugars in the desserts and all this. So do share your desserts with your family and families when you're eating. That tends to actually uh, reduce your uh, sugar intake as well. All right. So... So what are the nutrients that are good for your brain? So the answer is, oh, I'm sorry for the, the E. Um, so it's all of the above. So what you can see, the omega-3, the first rule that we talk about, we want to opt for healthy fats. And um, omega-3 mainly we get from fatty fish and the antioxidants mainly from the fruits and vegetables and the vitamin Bs are from the whole grains. So this actually turns into like our um, 
usual actually balanced kind of a meal. Yeah, where you can see in the diagram, there will be brown rice, a, a, a piece of salmon, uh, probably steak or fish, and then and also some vegetables. Yeah. So do you find it like uh, similar to actually it's like a Mediterranean way of eating where they encourage us a lot of uh, plant foods, nuts, seeds, whole grains, fishes. Yeah. So moderate amount of the chicken, eggs, and some dairy products and very little actually uh, red meat in their uh, diet and um, yeah research actually has shown that by following a Mediterranean diet actually it tends to uh, have they tend also to have actually a better brain health and a reduced risk actually of the dementia so dementia is what or uh, it's actually a chronic uh, um, process so um, we need to actually start uh, working on the diet right now even though you are probably in your 20s or 30s, we don't wait until we are 40s and then when the brain actually starts to shrink and then, then you want to do something about it. All right, so just a summary, the five natural ways to keep our brain healthy, um, of course, to eat well from uh, a dietitian's point of view and then move your body. So Fern has actually taught us uh, what are the exercise and the amount of exercise that you can do. And, um, and from Dr. Uh, uh, Coffin, and we need to actually keep our heart healthy as well because um, for the actually uh, brain to receive the nutrients and the oxygen, we need a good heart actually to pump all this actually to the brain as well. And obviously just now uh, somebody asked about uh, sleep. Yeah, so by having adequate quality sleep, actually it helps uh, to uh, keep our brain healthy. Um, and some of you might actually do some meditations that actually um, make us calm down and then maybe also to make us actually have a better actually quality of sleep as well. All right, so uh, this is just my contact details. If you, yeah, you can actually post the questions here and if you would want to, maybe one or two days later, you develop that, oh, you have some queries that these are my contact details. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Hui Xing. So I just want to add that Hui Xing has very kindly extended um, a special promotional prize and offer to all the viewers of the Brain Health Forum today. If you were to contact Hui Xing, should you need any consultation, um, you know, for any dietary advice, in any, in any case, like you want to eat healthier or you're not sure, you know, uh, maybe there's a loved one at home who needs some nutritional consultation, yeah, so please contact her. There is a 20% discount if you say that you actually heard about her uh, from Brain Health. So just say Brain Health Forum and then she will know that you are one of the audience today and you will get a 20% discount. Yeah. Thank Did you. I miss out anything? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much for typing that out. There is, uh, there, there are actually quite a few questions. Okay, one question. Let's take the easy ones first. Uh, inerts such as intestines, liver, kidney, Considered red meat. So, you know, like we eat those great up, that kind of thing, right? The inerts, are they considered? Right. Yes. Um, depending on the source of it. And then if it's cutting from red meat includes actually pork and then lamb um, or beef. Yeah. So if the organ meats are from these sources, uh, definitely they are red meat uh, sources, but uh, we don't encourage uh, in uh, yeah, organ meats at all because it's very high in cholesterol and it's actually not good for the uh, even the heart health or even the brain health as well. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So that would be probably if we really, really want to eat it, maybe maximum about maybe once a month. Yeah, that I would advise. <laughs> so no matter it's coming from a white meat like chicken liver or yeah. Right. Okay. There's another question uh, that's very interesting. Uh, so, okay, this is a little bit linked. So there's a latest question that popped up by uh, Fukuko who said, should we take dairy product? And there's another question about yogurt. So if yogurt, which is considered kind of high fat, does it mean we should avoid it? All right. So um, kind of what yeah. we can do is actually to choose um, low fat yogurt or even like uh, talking about milk and all this, depending on the amount of milk that you are taking. And then if let's say you are only taking and... Uh, Generally, your diet is very healthy and you just want to have a glass of full cream milk, then I would say it's okay. Yeah. But if let's say you are really eating all those deep fried foods and all this, and then on top of that, you want to have your full cream uh, dairy products and all this, then I would actually advise you to go for like a low fat or the skim milk. Yeah, rather. So um, yes, dairy products actually does give us the calcium that we need. Yeah, definitely. And then, so it's really depending on the overall diet quality. Yeah. If you really want to go on a, a healthier actually uh, options, then the uh, low fat or the no, no fat actually kind of a yogurt would be a better choice. 
in terms of dairy, I mean, this is out of curiosity because mm. I think right now the trending thing also is to take things like almond milk, oat milk. Are these mm. are these um alternatives? Because they tend to be a bit more expensive. Are these alternatives uh, superior or just as you know like equal? All right. So yeah. if mm. you look into the nutritional informations of um this oat milk or uh, maybe yeah or or almond milk, right? So usually the calcium content may not as high actually as um. Uh, definitely the the normal cow's milk itself and then um, sometimes it might but might have actually a little bit uh, more sugars in it as well um, but because it's from plant-based and definitely the fats the the component and then the fat quality is actually better yeah so um so you have to really uh, look for those uh, without added sugars in it and then on top of that you also need to make sure that you are getting enough calcium from elsewhere yeah so because um i think in singapore our main source of calcium would be coming from dairy products like calcium and all this and and there is a little bit actually um maybe calcium actually from the green leafy vegetables but usually that might the portions that we are taking right now that you will not actually provide us with sufficient calcium in it yeah right right there is thanks a lot facing and there's a question from daniel about plant-based diet and i think this mm. is uh really the trending topic these days especially because of this netflix um documentary called game changers and yep. people are talking about going vegan Right. right, like, like, um, what, what are the? Can I just go vegan? Like, you know, I can't imagine not eating this because vegan is very extreme. So, what's your take on plant based diet? Correct. Yeah. Actually, plant based diet is very good. And then, um, talking about, although there are not many actually research done on really uh, endorsing the vegan diet, but more actually research actually shows that like Mediterranean diet, which are not entirely plant based, but plant mostly plant based with some fish, seafoods, because why, um, if you are going on um, probably entirely actually being a vegan, and then um, over the time, you might actually have a deficiency in vitamin B12, which actually it's only uh, available in uh, animal source. Yeah, so that would be another concern. So sometimes I would ask my patients, if you want to go uh, uh, probably uh, if you are because of the re religious actually purpose and then it's okay, then you could monitor actually your blood levels and all this and get uh, supplements. But why are you following a certain actually diet? Uh, at the same time, you need to take something artificial or the supplements actually to supplement it. Why not actually take it uh, from the natural food sources? Then uh, that would be the ah. question I would post to right. the clients yeah so so interestingly there was a question that came in from facebook live um mm -hmm. that asked um uh, are there supplements you will recommend is that is that a big no then <laughs> um so <laughs> i would i would still uh, depending on the clients and the patients yeah so if your um result is really shows that you are deficient in certain vitamins or ions or even vitamin d's and all this and the first thing the doctor will do will prescribe you actually the supplements to actually raise up the levels yeah then right. subsequently i will actually uh, teach the clients actually to have adequate from the food sources itself because i i don't think anyone of us actually want to have the supplements actually lifelong unless or you, you really actually feel that it's giving you the benefits and you can't actually do much on your diet. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So what, you're, you, what you are suggesting, if I'm hearing you correctly, uh, is that natural is best, but yep. when there is deficiency, depending of, obviously depending on the individual needs, then we yep. might need to pump it with supplements, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. So lots of questions coming fast and furious about diet, but <laughs> um, we are mindful of the time. So right now we are opening the questions to the whole panel. Should you have any questions for Dr. Yong and Fern, please uh, feel free to ask. I know there were questions that we missed out earlier as well. Um, you can unmute yourself to ask as well. That, that will make things faster because right now we are taking the questions as they come along from Facebook as well as here. Yeah, and Facebook as well, audience, keep the questions coming. Um, thank you so much. So um, while we are getting all the questions from the other, uh, for the other speakers, I'm just going to quickly talk about, uh, ask these two questions from one, that a few people ask is the non non fat yogurt, um, isn't it replaced by worse off ingredients? And then Ian also said, but I also heard that non fat yogurt it has higher sugar. Is that true? <laughs> yes, if you actually look into the nutritional information, and then um, yeah, like I say, if you do it in moderation and you are not like uh, having like maybe like in overseas people are taking like a liter or two liters of milk in a day, and then but I think in our uh, context usually one or two glass is actually the max, and if you want to have like a tub or two of the yogurt, and then in a day and and you wanted to actually have a full cream one and making sure that uh, your other actually uh, fat sources are the healthier one, I think it's fine still if you want to stick to actually uh, the uh, full cream type of a yogurt like in moderation amount. 
Hmm. Thank you so much. Now, there's a question that came in from Facebook for Dr. Yong. Um, the, the audience wants to know, can you explain the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's? It's a technical question, but I think it's a really good one because we often you know, use it quite interchangeably. So can I have the spotlight on Dr. Yong? Oh. Uh, yeah, yes. What's yeah, the difference so, so... between Alzheimer's and dementia? Ah, good question. Uh, but essentially, Alzheimer is a type of dementia and is the commonest cause of uh, dementia still at this age. Um, dementia is just a broad term to include, uh, like what I said in the previous slide, that uh, it includes all brain disorders that, uh, are, that are associated with uh, reduction in your cognitive uh, uh, function, uh, with resultant impairment in your, your ADLs, your activities of daily living. So there are many types, Alzheimer is one, uh, then there are other types like vascular dementia that uh, usually happen in patients with uh, stroke or with uh, a lot of risk factors for stroke, such as high blood pressure, I mean hypertension, diabetes, and uh, uh, high cholesterol. Yeah, thanks for that. Thanks for explaining. I, and there is also, interestingly, we get this question about dementia and aphasia as well, just to share. And um, oh. there is a form of primary progressive aphasia, which is also a form of dementia just to highlight a little bit technical, but yeah, we get we got that question um, not in this talk, but in a previous uh, session. Yeah. Agree. There yeah. is a, there are many types of dementia. That's right. Yeah. Thanks for that, Prof. So, no problem. Um, yes. So another question, uh, we're going to switch back to Hui Sing because there's a question about the difference. Okay. So it's about benefits of food. Lah. So mm -hmm. this question is about, uh, you know, which is, so there are a couple of things. So one, one is, which is better, instant oats or raw oats? And then another one is, which is better, maple syrup or manuka honey? So All right. Things, yeah. So talking about uh, raw oats, do you mean by raw oats itself? And then, or the instant oats is the one that actually you can add water and, and it gets actually probably cooked uh, instantly. So um, they are both actually high in fiber. And then as long as it's not those three in one kind of uh, oatmeal cereal drinks that are uh, being added with the sugar, I think uh, both are equally good. Yep. So depending on you, for me, I use the raw oats actually to probably make my own homemade muesli. But I do use actually the normal cracker instant oats to probably add it in into my milk drinks uh, every morning. So it's really actually, uh, you don't really need to cook it and, and it saves a lot of time. Yeah. So I think take both as well mm. and uh, regarding manuka honey and um, uh, maple, syrup. maple syrup okay so both of these uh, I would consider as a sugars and uh, there's no better form of sugars in the world so it's either no sugar or you are eating some form of sugar so yeah be it comparing to like a refined sugars brown sugars or maybe uh, what some other actually uh, exotic sugars and all this, they are actually equally same to me, uh, providing the calories to us without uh, much actually nutrients in it. Of course, uh, someone can argue that actually in Manuka honey, there are certain um, minute kind of uh, minerals in it and some form of maybe antioxidants in it. But um, this way, really depending on you and the individual, whether they have significant actually benefits of taking. Uh, but in moderation, I think it's still fine if you uh, would want to take like a teaspoon a day, something like that. So while we are on the topic of sugars, a question came in about stevia. So uh, is right. stevia recommended? Okay, stevia, um, depending if you have actually like diabetes and uh, you want to actually make sure that your blood sugar is a better control, of course, we will actually advise you to replace your normal sugars with stevia and then in order for you to have a better sugar control. And uh, stevia is made on, uh, it's actually a natural plant. And so um, a, a lot of people feel that it's actually safer to have that, yeah, to be added into the drinks and all this, yeah. Uh, that's actually okay. Or maybe you are looking to lose weight and you don't want to have too much sugars in the drink itself, but you still actually prefer some sweetness in it, then you can also actually use that as well. Oh, okay, great. Thanks for that. So there is a question about exercise. I'm going to switch the screen. Thanks, Hui Sing. There's a question about exercise. It's um, not about high rate or anything, but it's a general question about I would really like my parents to exercise. So this came in from the audience, but I can't seem to encourage them to do any physical activity. What advice do you have for, from, you know, I think this is a caregiver, probably a child asking on behalf of, you know, elderly parents. Yeah. Oh, you're muted. Sorry, sorry. You're muted. <laughs> 
Okay, a very simple thing to do is to just start walking if they don't mind uh, the company of the children to bring them to the park to start some walks. Um, walking is a good simple exercise that a lot of people can do. Then of course, um, if they have got certain aches and pains somewhere, in, uh, a good way to anchor in will be to do some stretching because that helps to relieve the tension. Um, but of course, that's provided uh, the children have some understanding of which part of the muscles uh, it, it has the tension um, and that requires the stretching exercises. So usually that's uh, how I see it when we do exercises with the seniors. Uh, it has to be something that they find that the barrier of entry is not so high. So not doing like sports or you know something that is so difficult, needs a lot of motor skills. So walking is something that's simple enough for a lot of people to start off with. And um, the part that I mentioned about stretching is because uh, Everybody, not just seniors, everybody tend to have some aches and pains here and there. So if you can help to relieve that through the stretching, then they find it, hey, you know, there's something that's quite useful to me and then they will start to like to take it up slowly. Yeah. It takes time. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah. I think it's very, very good advice. I think just something as simple as just walking, right? Yeah. yeah. Really? yeah. It would be good if you can do some uh, accompanying, you know, the children can accompany them because uh, just now Dr. Yong mentioned about the social part of it as well. So if you just get them to walk on their own, they might not feel that it's something that is really necessary. Yeah. Right. Okay. So can, while can we are still on you, I'm very. Oh, sorry. Is that a question? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, yes. here. Can I just chip in? Uh, and uh, to to yes. what uh, Fern has just mentioned. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah. Mm. I I suppose um we we need to also address why our uh, grandpa grandma uh, uh is not or rather not keen to do us all, all these activities now. Mm-hmm. And and uh, some of the reasons are really uh how put it is 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 really appropriate. Uh, so example, I frequently hear in my practice that you know, a lot of them already fell once. They they worry about falling second time, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. the more they read uh, about bleeding in the brain, uh, the, the more worried they are. Mm-hmm. But we also need to address and and try to to uh, explain to them like what Fern has mentioned earlier that uh, regardless whether we are young or old, uh, the muscles will tend to. Uh, get a trophy, uh, will get wasted if you don't start moving your limbs. So, uh, it's one thing that we can use to try to to convince uh, our grandpa and our grandma, or yeah. any one of our friends. Yes, uh, I think uh, for especially for the seniors, because I work a lot with the seniors. Uh, a lot of them are very worried whenever they have a first fall. So they're worried that they fall again. However, the, it's a vicious cycle. So if they do not get their muscles to be stronger by doing the exercise, they will get weaker and there is a higher chance for them to fall again. Yeah, so they have to break out of the vicious cycle. Right. Mm. Thanks for that. And there's a question, there's a really good question that came in from Facebook. What kind of cardio exercise would you recommend for those with kneecap issues or if they are too heavy, like they are too yeah, mm. big size? Yeah. Right. Yeah, mm. uh, something that gets their... Uh, weight of their body. Yeah, heart rate. So, yeah. For, uh, okay. uh, uh, so for example, swimming. So because when your weight in the water will be less than on land. So uh, if you cannot swim, but you are not afraid of water, you can just do walking in the water. So uh, aqua walking, we call it. So that is actually a very good form of uh, exercise for people who are on the heavier side of with kneecap issues. Um, cycling will be also good because that also does not put the whole body weight onto your kneecap. Good. Yeah, thanks for that. That's that's uh, really awesome. I mean, the walking in water. Um, there are more questions about diet. I'm just going <laughs> to uh, quickly flip back to pacing. So there is this thing about, um, do we have to consider the intensity of our daily physical activity when we plan our t- nutritional intake? Uh, oh so God. for example, if we train for a marathon, do we eat more carbs than fiber? Um, depending on uh, what kind of marathon are you talking about, is it like a 10K or the half marathon or the full mat- marathon? Yeah, so um, obviously there are cup loading that the athletes are doing actually uh, for a strenuous kind of a training. And then, yeah, so they will be actually eating a lot of carbohydrates actually to increase the glycogen storage so that they can actually um, probably uh, sustain longer. So um, it's really depending on the, the type of exercise that you are doing. If let's say talking about the usual exercise um, that we do running and all this, right? Usually we don't, if you are uh, probably not actually considering to put on weight, uh, I don't suggest you to maybe add on foods and then just to compensate actually whatever that you have expand actually through the physical activities because we tend to uh, probably use uh, lesser energy than what we are uh, taking it in from the food itself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And to add on to uh, Hui Xing's 
point, if you're doing marathon, uh, if you have been continuously exercising for more than 90 minutes, then that's where additional intake is required. Yeah. Can I, can I check with you also? Uh, I've got two knee replacements. Um, and uh, what would exercises would you recommend for people like me? Uh, one of our member audience, yes. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. So uh just now we mentioned if you are okay with water, it would be great. If not, uh sometimes cycling and swimming might be a bit troublesome. Um if you can do simple walking, um that would be a good start. Yeah. So walking in water, lah. Uh, yeah, but the... if you can't go to the pool, uh walking yes. on land is also a good start. Yeah. Other than walking, what about? I mean, I've been doing some exercises, but because mm. of the circuit breaker, it's it's sort of uh, stopped. So mm. uh, it's uh, half an hour. It's like those um meridian type of exercise where you use the flapper and all that, you know. But <laughs> and, uh. and also uh, uh, breathing exercises and all that. Like. So right. Yeah, right. And, and also uh, so I. So don't I think the the question. That I would like to pose back to you is uh, what is the kind of uh, heart rate intensity that you are having when you're doing the exercise? Uh, it's, right. it's okay. Mm. I, I feel that it, I can take it, you know, every mm. morning when you go down for half an hour. And, and it's every day, every day, uh, half an hour exercise. Mm. So, so that's why my question to you is when you next ex do the exercise, can you please uh, measure your heart rate and then do oh. the calculation to see whether you are at your target yeah. intensity. Because okay. when you're doing the exercise and if you're not at that intensity, then you do not achieve the kind of cardiovascular benefit that we're looking at. Okay. Yeah. I think Thank you. a good time Thank you. to bring up that slide because there was a request from the audience to see the formula again. Oh, okay. Um, so okay. Of them okay. actually would like to take a photo yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I see. Yeah. I see, I see. So I think okay, you okay. can share, sure. share that screen. And uh, I'm very mindful of the time. Thank you all so much for spending your last one and a half hours with us. Um, well, I, I, I will be around, so so we will we can actually, it's already past 4.30, but I think we need to release our panelists and thank them. But when, um, if you put up the slide, then um, yeah, after that, we will be able to, yeah. Can you see it? Yeah, yes, we can. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can full screen now. Maybe you can full screen, yeah. Oh, yeah, so do Choo -choo. snap a photo. I think this is great. I, I never knew this as well. I'm gonna go and try, like, you know, you know what is a good exercise. Yeah. So I think the fastest way is to just snap a picture. And um yeah. Okay, so with that, I'm going to uh once everyone is done. Can can we all kind of give can we all give a big round of applause, you know, for our speakers again? I'm like, like a normal event where we have face to face. But thank you all so much. Um, we really, really appreciate your time. Uh, thank you, Fern. Thank you, Dr. Yong. And thank you, and thank you, Hui Sing, you know, for sharing so much valuable insights with us about brain health. I know that an hour and a half isn't enough. Lah. This is an extensive topic, right? Yeah. Uh, is there any last thing that y'all want to add before we end the session for good? <laughs> but anything from you? <laughs> no, all good. Yeah. Um, please so, think and so for... Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah I guess um, me. I'm not too sure whether you still remember what are the five rules. <laughs> <laughs> um, we will yeah, put I just up the it... information on Aphasia SG page. Yes. Sure. Ah, yes, we think. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So maybe just actually make a uh, one small step. At the time and and choose to make one change actually from today onwards yeah so you don't need to do all but pick one and then and uh, that you think that you are not doing so good and yeah make a change from there that is such great advice yeah thank you so um stop in dr young any any final final advice <laughs> i suppose uh, <laughs> uh try to live as healthily as possible before <laughs> before something happens and if something do, does happen uh, seek help as soon as possible right yeah uh, and finally take everything into moderation i suppose yeah. um especially like what has we seen mentioned a lot um 
uh, going full vegan diet, I, I do respect uh, certain cultural belief, practice, uh, but uh, going full vegan diet may, may, may also have their own uh, uh, issues uh, that's, that one need to be aware of before adopting the practice. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, thanks everyone. So thank you once again, our esteemed panelists, you know, Dr. Yong, Fei Sing, and Fern. We really, really appreciate and we are very honored to have the three of you to spend your time, your special Sunday afternoon with us. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, audience. Thank uh, before thank we, so thank before we leave, can yeah. we all take a photo? Oh yeah, great. Yeah, take a photo, right? That's um, Eva, yeah. <laughs> and thank you, Facebook audience as well. Thank you so much for joining us. You have been awesome. The questions came fast and furious. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. um, I'll take the photo now. All right, three, yeah. two, yeah. one. Okay, next page. There are three pages. <laughs> three, oh, wow. two, one. And last one, three, two, one. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Have a good rest of Sunday, okay? Have a good okay. rest. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Yes, thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Okay, I'm gonna end. So